Uh, as Pastor Jeff comes this morning, let's just give him all of our attention. Amen. Let's turn our phones off. You know, let's, let's pay attention this morning. I believe God wants to use this man this morning. I know he's spoken into my life many, many times. And, you know, Pastor Ferguson, Brother Bill, I'm speaking to, thank you for sharing into your son's life because he's impacted my life. And that's just the way God works, isn't it? We just continue to share in others, and they continue to share in others. And I just uh, see this man as like a father figure to me, and I love Pastor Jeff like my own dad, and I mean that with all of my heart. He's an amazing guy. So would you give, I'm honored to announce today, my father figure and my pastor, Jeff Ferguson. Thank you, Trevor. When I was introducing the great-grandparents, I did the unpardonable sin. I did not introduce my mom and dad, and it is an honor and a privilege for me to have them today. Um, they're not only my parents, they're my heroes. And I, I want you to know that, that uh, any good thing is a result of God and them. Any bad thing is a result of me. But... Um, Dad has just been a godly example to me of what a pastor should be, of what a dad should be, and a father. My mom was rock solid. She was my dad's right-hand person for many, many years. As you know, my mom is battling with Alzheimer's, and we weren't sure if they were going to be able to be with us today. But Barbara, that's my sister down here, thank you for the effort that you and Bob put forth in making sure that my mom and dad could be here today and a part of this and I love and appreciate you guys very much and all of my family and my new family as well as a result of Logan. Uh, what an honor and a privilege to have you all here. And I, and I mean that sincerely. Today, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to need a lot of help because I've never preached a sermon one arm before. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of Changing the story. And, you know, God works together with us in many different ways. Your story, as of today, may be going a certain direction. But I have a message of hope for you today, and that is this. It doesn't have to continue to go the way that it is going if it's going in a direction that you're not happy with. Now, to the best of my knowledge, many of you, if not all of you, at some point in time in your life have received Jesus Christ into your life. You know the difference that he makes and what have you. But if you have yet to invite Christ into your life as your personal Savior, as your personal Lord, I want you to know that your story can change when you include God, you involve God, and you not only give mental assent to the fact that there is a God acknowledging his existence, that you understand that he wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us and be my God, be your God, that you not only know about Jesus, but you know him to be a friend, a savior, an ever-present help in your hour of need. I invite you to turn with me in the word of God today if you have your Bible, or if not, pay attention to the PowerPoint here behind me. We're going to look together at two verses that is found in Isaiah chapter 43. And if I could ask you to stand one more time in reverence to the reading of God's word. Good to have Stuart and Karen Mercer with us today as well. God bless you. They're good friends with uh, Jim Bowles. In fact, I think Stuart and Jim attended college together at James Madison. Is that correct? Yeah. Good to have you. God bless you. Good to see you today. And others of you as well. Delighted to have you in the service this morning. But notice what the Word of God says here in Isaiah chapter 43, beginning to read with verse 18 and finishing with verse 19. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Holy Spirit, I need your help today. I need you to walk before me into this pulpit. 
I would ask three things today, Lord. First of all, that you would anoint my mouth, my mind, that I might bring forth your word unapologetically. I pray that I'll bring it forth with clarity. And I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, that it will produce a bountiful harvest. Second, I would ask that you would also open the ears of everyone that is here today. Help us to be receptive, O oh God, to your word as it comes forth. And third, I would ask that you also, O oh God, would just help our hearts to be receptive to your word. Holy Spirit, as your anointing is upon it, you've promised that it will not return until you void. Might it accomplish today what you're desiring to do in this place? And if there would be individuals here who don't know you as their Savior, I would pray that as your word goes forth, the Lord, it will penetrate their heart. Help them to understand that you love them, that you're concerned about them. And Lord, you desire to be their personal Savior, their personal Lord, that you might have a relationship with them. I pray, Father, that we'll see lives encouraged. People have a renewed hope and a confidence in knowing that in every circumstance, God ultimately is in control. For this, we'll give you praise and thanksgiving. And all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. How many of you here among us today would like to have the opportunity for a fresh start? Several hands are going up. Perhaps it involves a fresh start in your lives, maybe your finances, or perhaps even your career. As those of you who live in this area know, this past week there's been a forest fire that's been burning in the Shenandoah National Park, some 8,000 acres, I'm told. And when the wind shifted on Wednesday, a blanket of smoke engulfed the city of Harrisonburg. In fact, it was so bad that in our case, we couldn't see on the other side of Interstate 81, which is a pretty much common occurrence out of our front living room window where we can have a view of CSAT on the campus at JMU. You know, it's in times like that, that it's hard to remember that above the cloud of smoke is a beautiful, clear blue sky filled with crisp, fresh air. Because when I was outside, the air quality index was very bad. In fact, they canceled after school activities for uh, all the schools here in the Harrisonburg area. And when you went outside, there was a definite smell of smoke that permeated the air. You know, sometimes circumstances in life can be like smoke that dampens our perspective of life. The two greatest enemies of life are regrets for things that we did in the past and anxiety about what will happen to you and I in the future. Many of us are either living in the past or in the future. Someone once made this statement. They said, life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. Isn't that true? Life is what happens when you are making plans to do something else. However, I am a firm believer that God is leading us in a time of refreshing. And we all have a part to play in it. You might be in the fire right now or lost in the smoke or the haze of life with the circumstances that are confronting you. But just like fire burns out the underbrush in the forest to allow new growth to occur, so God allows the fires of life to periodically clear out the brush and the debris that have accumulated in our lives that is inhibiting spiritual growth to take place in each and every one of us. Rather than complaining, I challenge you to use those times for reflection and assessment. God loves you so much that despite the mistakes, the shortcomings, and the broken promises you have made, he still desires to give you another chance. God is saying here in our text today, forget what has happened in the past. Today is a new day. We can never enter our tomorrow as long as we remain standing in our yesterday. What has happened to us in the past, can either serve as a springboard or as an anchor. And I encourage you to acknowledge the past, but move to the future. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
We might be sitting there this morning and asking yourself, how do we move beyond past mistakes? And how do we rise above present set of circumstances that we find ourselves confronted with? Well, I believe that we can start by acknowledging the reality of where we are, but not allow it to keep us from seeing where we can be. Let's view the following video that speaks about how together with God's help, we can change the story. You see, together with God's help, we can change the story in people's lives. I want to remind you today that you are not alone. Not only do you have a God who loves you and cares for you, but you also have a church family that God has placed in your life to come alongside of you, that whatever your need may be, know that there are people who care about you, people who pray for you daily. And I believe that our attitude toward prayer tells God where our priorities are. You see, quite simply stated, no individual is greater than his or her prayer life. The person who is not praying is straying. I'm going to say that again. The person who is not praying is straying. But when people start praying, they focus on a higher purpose for their lives things begin to change for the better. Can you say amen? Let me just bring this home. Yesterday, when I tripped, I had my dog in my arms, and I knew that if I landed on it, that the dog would be either be seriously hurt or perhaps killed because it's a pug and just a tiny little thing. And rather than putting my hands out to break the fall, I went ahead and fell face down. And as quickly as it happened, I saw that my face was going to hit on the edge of a concrete step. I knew that was bad news. I mean, I'm ugly enough. I didn't need any more help. But I turned my head out of the way, and I prayed, God, help me. And my shoulder hit on the edge of the concrete step and dislocated it. And if you've ever had a dislocated shoulder, it's no fun. Just take my word for it. When I got to the emergency room, they said, give me a, a scale of one being the least amount of pain and 10 being the worst, what would you say you are? I said about 30. <laughs> but the point that I'm making is this. In that split instance, in that split instance, it's amazing how quickly you can pray and call out to the Lord. Now, I can't prove it to you, but I will say this. I saw the concrete step coming, 
I believe that an angel stepped in and pushed me over just far enough that my head missed it and I caught it with my shoulder. And, you know, it could have been a whole lot more serious than, than what it proved to be. But, you know, I, I want to emphasize to you the importance of prayer. And don't wait until you're in a crisis to start praying. Know God in a personal way on a daily basis that, that when you begin to pray, you don't have to act like he's a stranger or you don't have to be embarrassed about approaching him, but you will know him because you spend, day talk, spend every day talking to him. And when people start praying, as we said, they focus on a higher purpose for their lives and things begin to change for the better. And you can begin to believe God for greater things. Remember, God is more interested in our future than he is with our past. Why? Well, because the future is where you're going to spend the rest of your life. I can't change my past. Memories have already been made. Mistakes have already been made. Good things have happened and so on and so forth. I cannot go back and unchange those. I can only remember them and hopefully dwell on the good and forget about the bad and recognize that God is interested in my future and as bad or as sad as my past may have been, praise God, now that I have God in my life, I am looking forward to better things. Can you say amen? You see, the past is over. It's a closed book. And regardless, I emphasize, regardless of the failures that you may have had in your life up till now, God has a plan for you. The Word of God tells me in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it tells us the kind of thoughts that God has toward us. Listen to what it says. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. How many of you need a hope? I mean, as, as I am living in this world, as I'm going out and I'm talking to people and whatever, I've never seen such a look of distraughtness and, and dismay on people's face. People are looking for something to believe in. People are looking for hope. People are looking for a future. They're, they're wanting to know that indeed things are not always going to be the way that they are now. Give me a purpose to get out of bed in the morning. Give me a hope, pastor. Well, I want you to know something today. God has a plan and a purpose for your life that leads to a future that is filled with hope. Praise the Lord. And we can take that to the bank. We can know that it's a truth. Thoughts of peace and not of evil is what he promises us there in Jeremiah 29, 11. Friends, I wanna encourage you to begin to understand this morning that the things that you thought would never happen are about to be. The things that you have prayed for and seemingly God is checked out, God's on vacation, God's not listening, God's you know, paying attention to other things or whatever. My Bible tells me that the eyes of God are continuously running to and fro upon the face of this earth, that he's aware of all things that are taking place. There's not even a sparrow that falls to the ground that he is not aware of. If God is that concerned about the well-being and the welfare of a sparrow, how much more are you and I as the crown of his creation precious in his sight? God is concerned about the affairs that are taking place in your life and in mine. And when we involve him by talking with him in prayer, prayer is nothing complicated. It's simply a matter of talking to God like you would talk to a friend. Sharing with him your life, sharing with him your needs, sharing with him your concerns, and, and also blessing him and thanking him for past blessings and things that he has made provision for in your life. Not only or the things that you thought would never happen are about to take place, but the things that you thought would always be the same are about to cease. Change is coming. And praise God, it's not just change for the sake of change, but praise the Lord, it is God-inspired change. God promises you and I transformational change. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 17, it says, But if any man be in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hallelujah. I am thankful that I'm not the man that I once was, but you know what excites me even more? I'm not the man that the word of God says I can become. As I put my complete dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm glad that even though there's room for improvement, I'm not the one that's doing it by myself. The Holy Spirit is leading and guiding and directing. And as long as I walk in obedience, it is amazing what God can do in bringing about God-inspired transformational change. You see, the way things have been are not the way that things will always be. God has never forgotten 
the vision that he gave us. His plan is still to bring the fulfillment of that vision to take place in your life and in mine. But we need to remember that everything that happens in our lives has an appointed time. Now, you know what's hard for me to accept, and I'm just being honest. I'm trying to be transparent here this morning. The thing that's hard for me to accept is that God's times plan or time schedule is not always mine. Anybody here ever struggle with that P word, patience? Am I the only one? I see some hands going up. We're going to have an altar call in just a few moments for those of you who didn't raise your hand. I struggle with patience. Oh, my goodness. I mean, quite frankly, that's, that's probably why I fell yesterday. I was in a hurry. I didn't take the time. You know, I, I want to get something done, and I want to get it done yesterday so I can hurry up and do something else. But, you know, God's not in a hurry. And the thing that I'm growing to understand is this. When I pray for something, God is not only interested in blessing me, but he's interested in blessing others as well. So that when he does bring about the answer to my prayers, I am not the sole beneficiary of the answer to my prayer, but there are others that are benefiting from it as well. God's fitting the pieces in place. And when the timing is perfect, you see the answer on time. I've shared this with you before, but it bears repeating. Jim Wellborn, a, a good friend of mine who's an evangelist from Ohio, he has this saying, God is the slowest person I know, but he's always right on time. And it's so true, isn't it? And times in my life, it seems like, God, you're so slow. Where are you? Why Are you even listening? Are you even paying attention? God, are, 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 you, you, know, are you getting it? Lord, are, are you hearing the desperation in my voice? And it seems like he's dragging his feet. He's asleep at the switch. He, he's nowhere to be found. But so help me, right in the nick of time, God is always there. Always faithful in coming through and performing the promises of his word. Everything is for an appointed time. The prophet Habakkuk tells us in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, it says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Hallelujah. Sometimes I need to write it on a large billboard, is really what it was saying there, one of the large tablets. I need to put it on a billboard. I need to keep it in remembrance before me. I need to remember that God has said it, and therefore I can count on it becoming a reality in my life. That it's not just empty words. It's not just something to fill up a, a space in the Bible. But it's God who said it. And if God said it, how many of you know it's going to happen? In the fulfillment of his time. Wait for it. Wait for it. Because it will take place in its appointed time. You see, friend... God clears the haze that keeps us from seeing his plan. If you want a fresh start in life, you and I must stop making excuses. Stop blaming other people and seeing yourself as a victim of circumstances. Because the plain truth is this, the only person that can ruin your life is you, and no one can ruin your life without your permission. Did you hear what I said? The only person that can ruin your life is you, and no one can ruin your life without your permission. You have to decide how you're going to react. You have to decide, you know, what path am I going to take? Am I going to take a path of retaliation? Am I going to allow it to get me discouraged and to give up and, and, and feel as though there's no reason to go on in life? Or am I going to understand that this person does not control me? God has a plan for my life that he's promised me will give me a future and a hope. You have a choice. I have a choice. And we can choose how we're going to respond to those who would try to hurt us. The Bible says that the starting point is just to be honest and accept responsibility for your part in the problem. Stop rehearsing the past and get on with the present. Believe the day that with God's guidance and strength, the future will be better. I'm not a singer. I don't pretend to be. But when I make that statement, there's a song that pops in my mind from a, a play on Broadway, Annie. The sun will come out, 
tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow. So on and so forth. I don't want you to leave. I'm not done preaching yet. That's why I preach instead of sing, Kevin. But the point that I'm making is this. There are times in your life and in mine where I can't see the hand of God. There are times that I can't sense his presence. There are times that I forget in the midst of the circumstances and situations that are going on around me that God is still there and God is still in control. And because he's omniscient, he is all-knowing. There is nothing that ever takes him off guard or by surprise. God knows the outcome before it becomes a reality. You see, believe that with God's guidance and strength, the future will always be better. Oh, there will be disappointments in life, but every day that passes is one day closer to the finish line of life. Amen? If your goal and my goal as a Christian is heaven, then all these little setbacks in life are only set stepping stones getting us closer to the time when you and I are going to spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to heaven. I can't wait till the day comes that I'm going to spend an eternity with the Lord. No more pain, no more tears, no more heartaches, no more disappointments. But praise God, the Prince of Peace, the Savior of my soul, is going to be there. And praise God, not just for a week, not just for a month, not just for a year, but for all eternity. Praise God. You see, God and God alone gives us a healthy purpose in life. Understand with me this morning, my friend, you are such a treasured person in God's sight that he gave his only begotten son just for you, just for you. You are so valuable to God. You are such a treasure in God's sight that God gave his only begotten son just for you, that you might have this wonderful gift of eternal life. John 3, verse 16 and 17, for God so loved the world, come on, quote it with me, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Praise God. Praise the Lord. You see, it's, it's what's called in church lingo, and I, I don't like church lingo because we, we have a lot of cliches that someone who's not been brought up in the church, sometimes they look at us and say, what? What are you talking about? It's almost like a foreign language. But I think you understand this morning, what we're talking about here is being born again. And when I say the term born again, it means that God is extending you a chance to start over. You don't like how things are going? Hit the reset button. Amen? Hit the reset button. God gives you and I the ability to hit the reset button, and we can start over again. If I've made mistakes, praise God, my Bible tells me God not only forgives, but he forgets. It's just as though I had never done it. The blood of Jesus Christ washes the slate clean and gives me a brand new start. Hallelujah. You see, quite simply stated, God does not want you and I just to turn over a new leaf. He wants to give us a fresh start. God condemns our sin, but praise God, he does not reject us. God condemns sin, but he does not reject us. I'm here to tell you today, mercy, not judgment, is God's final word. God will always err on the side of mercy rather than judgment. Now, don't read more into that statement than what I mean. I know the Bible very clearly tells us that there will be a time of judgment reserved for those who do not confess their sins and receive Jesus Christ into their life. The Bible very clearly tells me that there's going to be a day that each and every one of us will stand before the Lord and give an account of our life, either at the judgment seat of Christ as a person who's received Christ into my life and my works are going to be tried by fire, or at the great white throne judgment where I have rejected the plan of salvation, where I have rejected even though I've heard that God loves me, God wants to give me this gift of eternal life that we refer to as salvation, but I have rejected it. No, God, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. I don't need a Savior. Listen, friend, if you and I could have saved ourselves, Jesus would never have had to go to the cross. 
There are a lot of things that I can do, but I cannot save myself. My righteousness, my good works are as but filthy rags in the eyes of God. But praise God when I confess that I am a sinner and listen, not me, the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ has come to give us life and life abundantly, praise the Lord, by putting our complete trust and confidence in what he did through his death and through his resurrection. Praise the Lord. Paul, the apostle, tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. I love those verses. What that says to me is this, no matter what hell may throw at me, no matter what circumstances of life may throw at me, there is nothing that can separate me from the love of God. It's called an unconditional love. It's called a tenacious love. The love of a bulldog. You know how when a bulldog gets a hold of something, it won't let go? That's how God is with you and I. When he gets a hold of your life, he's not gonna let you go. He'll be there for you in every set of circumstances, in every situation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God rather than you of your own free will rejecting him and saying, God, I don't need you. Oh, I love this. We may turn away from God, but he will never turn away from us. We may turn away from God, but he will never turn away from us. Romans 15, 4 tells us, for whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. There's that H word again, hope. That we might have hope. Just like fire produces smoke that makes it difficult to see. Sometimes life's circumstances can cloud our vision of God's presence walking with us through difficult times. However, God loves us too much to allow the debris of sin to hinder us from becoming the masterpiece that he has created us to be. Just as physical fire removes the underbrush to make way for new life in the forest, so spiritual fire burns off the shackles of sin to give to each and every one of us eternal life. As our praise team makes their way forward, towering over the wrecks of our life stands an old rugged cross. But oh, I remind you again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have eternal life. You see, quite simply stated, God so loved the world that he gave his best so that you and I could have his best as well. Together, he can change your story. It's your choice. Together, he can change your story. But it boils down to the fact, it's your choice. Bow your head with me in prayer, if you would. Heavenly Father, today we have done our best to bring forth your word so that even the youngest among us might have the understanding of your love for us. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And today, Lord, I would pray that as your word has gone forth, that it will not return into your void. I pray, God, that it's penetrated our hearts, that as our ears have been opened, that we will be responsive, Lord, to the knock that's taking place at our heart's door today as you're standing there patiently saying, open the door, allow me to come in. Lord, there's so many of us that have a knowledge of God. We believe there's a God. We believe that he loves us. We even believe that you went to the cross and died for our sins. But 
Lord, do we understand that we are all sinners in need of a Savior? And the only thing that will wash away our sin, our transgressions, is by asking you for forgiveness of our sins and inviting you into our life as our Lord, as our Savior. It's not important about what church we belong to, what denomination we are. That's not what's going to save us. What's going to save me is recognizing that I need Jesus. I'm not happy with the way things have been going in my life, or maybe I have been happy with the way things have been going, but there's still something missing. When it gets down to the bottom line, there, there's, there's something that's not there. And that missing piece can only be filled with the knowledge of knowing that Christ is my Lord, is my Savior, that he's washed away my every sins, and I now have the blessed hope of spending an eternity with him. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, my friend, I want to encourage you to understand God loves you so much and he's not willing that any should perish. Today, he wants to be your Lord, your Savior. I'm not asking you to join any particular church. I'm simply asking today, has there been a time in your life where you recognize that you were a sinner and you needed God to forgive you. If you've never prayed a prayer and asked him to forgive you of your sins, if you've never asked him to be your personal savior, your personal Lord, there's no better time than to do it right now. I don't stand here as your judge. I stand here as a messenger of God, proclaiming the truth of his word. And as much as I desire for you to know Christ, how much more does he desire for you to know the Lord? So today, as this word is going forth, and you sense something tugging at your heart's string, you sense that things are not the way that they need to be between you and God, but you would like to invite him into your life. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm going to ask you just simply right where you are to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, pray for me. I need Jesus today. My heart is not right with God. I know I'm a sinner. And today, I want to ask him into my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Anyone? You need Jesus today. Would you pray with me the following prayer? Dear Lord, I ask today that you would come into my life as my Savior and Lord. I know I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. But you took my place on the cross of Calvary, paid the debt for my sins in full. I ask today that you would write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Give me that hope and assurance of knowing that my sins are forgiven, that I am your child and you are my God. Thank you for hearing my prayer and giving me the promise of spending an eternity with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can we give a clap offering to the Lord this morning? God is so good. God is so good. As you prayed that prayer this morning, and as you were sincere in praying it, God has heard your sin, or your prayer. He has forgiven you of your sin and removed it as far from you as the east is from the west, is what the psalmist tells us in Psalm 103.